All right, up next we have our headliner for this evening, uh, Professor uh, Marjorie Cohn. Uh, Professor Marjorie Cohn is a professor of law at Thomas Jefferson School of Law in San Diego and past president of the National Lawyers Guild. She lectures throughout the world on international human rights and U.S. foreign policy. She has testified before Congress and, mil and at military court martials about the illegality of wars, the duty to obey lawful orders, and the du duty to disobey unlawful orders. She is working on her fifth book about drones and targeted killing. Her frequent columns appear on the Huffington Post, Truth Out, Alter Net, Common Dreams, Counterpunch, Op News, Atlantic Free Press, ZNet, and Global Research. And her website is www.marjoriecone.com. Without further ado, Professor Marjorie Cone. about the illegality of the Iraq War, tie it into the illegality of the Vietnam War. Both of them violate the UN Charter, both of them wars of aggression. And also tie that into the whistleblowers, particularly Bradley Manning and, uh, and the My Lai Massacre. And I have some of my books back there that deal with these themes. Um, the Cowboy Republic, Six Ways the Bush Gang Has Defied the, the, uh, the Law. Uh, starts out with chapter one, which is called The War of Aggression, and some of my talk is taken from that chapter, which goes through and documents how um, Bush violated the law and committed a war of aggression in Iraq. And then the rules of disengagement, the politics and honor of military dissent, actually flips back and forth between Vietnam and Iraq and the illegality of both and, um, and resistance Drone alert. Unrelated to the drones. Drone alert. <laughs> um, and talks about resistance within the military to both of those wars. And then the last book is, is about torture, which documents uh, many of the war crimes committed during the Bush administration. Sorry that that's so distracting. I'm just going to keep going, and then just, maybe that will yeah. no. oh, stop. Yeah. Oh, all right. Let's see, maybe a, a minute. Okay, I have to stop. The weekend of April 5th is Drone Diego in San Diego. I don't think anybody has, uh, has announced that. Uh, but there are going to be people coming from all over the country uh, having workshops and teach-ins and, and protests about the drones, uh, many of which are manufactured right here in San Diego. George W. Bush's invasion of Iraq violates the United Nations Charter, which the United, Na United States signed in 1945 after the bloodiest conflict in history. The Charter permits countries to use military force against another country only in two instances, in self-defense or if the Security Council approves the invasion. Bush's war in Iraq satisfied neither of these exceptions and therefore constitutes, under Nuremberg, a crime against peace, a crime of aggression. Although Bush marketed his war in Iraq as necessary to protect us from Saddam Hussein's weapons of mass destruction, his decisions had less to do with self-defense than with dominating the oil-rich Middle East. After 9-11, the Bush administration attacked Afghanistan and removed the Taliban from power. But the primary target all along was Iraq. To sell the war to the American people, the administration made two claims and repeated them like a mantra. First, Iraq had weapons of mass destruction. And second, Iraq had ties with al-Qaeda and both reasons justified the use of force against Iraq, even though the Bush administration was repeatedly told that these things were false. A report in 2006 pre prepared by um, Congressman John Conyers found that members of the Bush administration misstated, overstated, and manipulated intelligence with regards to linkages between Iraq and al-Qaeda the acquisition of nuclear weapons by Iraq, 
the acquisition of aluminum tubes to be used as uranium centrifuges, and the acquisition of uranium from Niger. On September 21st, 2001, Bush was told in his President's Day Brief that the intelligence community had no evidence connecting Saddam Hussein's regime to the 9-11 attacks. Furthermore, there was no credible evidence that Iraq had any significant collaborative ties with Al-Qaeda. This was no surprise. Al-Qaeda was a consortium of intensely religious Islamic fundamentalists, whereas Hussein ran a secular government that repressed religious activity in Iraq. To support their claims that Iraq was training Al-Qaeda members, Bush, Cheney, and Colin Powell, Colin Powell, by the way, helped to cover up the My Lai massacre for a year until Seymour Hersh broke the story. I don't think a lot of people realize that. But Bush, Cheney, and Powell repeatedly cited information provided by Sheikh al-Libi, an al-Qaeda prisoner, captured shortly after 9-11. The CIA duct-taped al-Libi's mouth, cinched him up, and sent him to Cairo for some more fearsome Egyptian interrogations in violation of U.S. law prohibiting extraordinary rendition and torture. Now, Libby's account proved worthless. Now, Libby provided his American interrogators with false material, suggesting Iraq had trained al-Qaeda to use weapons of mass destruction. <coughs> Even though U.S. intelligence thought the information was untrue as early as 2002 because it was obtained by torture, Al Libby's information provided the centerpiece of Colin Powell's now thoroughly discredited claim before the United Nations that Iraq developed WMD programs. Unable to find any WMD connection between Iraq and the 9-11 attacks, Bush never wavered in his march toward war. On September 15, 2001, in a meeting at Camp David, Defense Secretary Donald Rumsfeld suggested an attack on Iraq because he was deeply worried about the availability of good targets in <coughs> Afghanistan. Former De Deputy Defense Secretary Paul Wolfowitz argued that war against Iraq might be easier than Afghanistan. In late November 2001, Bush instructed Rumsfeld to develop an Iraq war plan. In his January 2002 State of the Union address, Bush declared that countries like Iraq, Iran, and North Korea constituted an axis of evil. These regimes pose a grave and growing danger. I will not wait on events while dangers gather, he said. In July 2002, a highly classified document titled CENTCOM Courses of Action was leaked to the New York Times. Prepared two months earlier, it contained what the Pentagon labeled a war plan for invading Iraq. The document, which indicated an advanced stage of planning, called for tens of thousands of Marines and soldiers to attack Iraq from the air, land, and sea to topple Saddam, Saddam Hussein. The Downing Street memo contained the secret minutes of a July 2002 meeting with Tony Blair and Sir Richard Dearlove, Chief of British Intelligence. Dearlove reported that Bush had already decided to go to war and was making sure the intelligence and facts about Iraq and WMD were being fixed around the policy of war on Iraq. National Security Advisor Condoleezza Rice warned, we don't want the smoking gun to become a mushroom cloud. Three weeks before the midterm elections, Congress gave, gave Bush the joint resolution to authorize the use of United States Armed Forces against Iraq. <coughs> the White House wanted to pass the resolution while many in Congress were facing re-election. Those who opposed Bush's war in Iraq would be painted as soft on terror. The resolution said Iraq posed a continuing threat to the national security of the United States by continuing to possess and develop a significant chemical and biological weapons capability and actively seeking a nuclear weapons capability. It authorized the president to use the armed forces to defend the national security of the United States against the continuing threat posed by Iraq and to enforce all relevant United Nations Security Council resolutions regarding Iraq. 
Iraq didn't pose a threat to the United States, and only the Security Council has the power to enforce its resolutions. But Congress capitulated to the Bush gang's hyperbole and intense pressure. In his 2003 State of the Union address, Bush famously claimed the British government has learned that Saddam Hussein recently sought significant quantities of uranium from Africa. It was pure fiction. Why was Bush so determined to invade Iraq? Wolfowitz admitted that the WMD rationale was a bureaucratic excuse for war that everyone could agree on. When no WMD turned up, Wolfowitz revealed a new raison d'etre. The invasion of Iraq was a way to redraw the Middle East to reduce the terrorist threat to the United States. In November 2002, Rumsfeld sought to decouple oil access from regime change in, New York, in, in Iraq when he claimed that the U.S. beef with Iraq had nothing to do with oil, literally nothing to do with oil. In February 2001, a month before Bush's inauguration, White House officials had discussed a memo called Plan for Post-Saddam Iraq, which described troop requirements, establishing war crimes tribunals, and dividing up Iraq's oil wealth. Meanwhile, Treasury Secretary Paul O'Neill was astonished to discover that actual plans were already being discussed to take over Iraq and occupy it, complete with disposition of oil fields, peacekeeping forces, and war crimes tribunals, carrying forward an unspoken doctrine of preemptive war. And those war crimes tribunals were to try Iraqis, not American leaders, by the way. The UN Charter requires all members to settle their international disputes by peaceful means. No nation can use military force against the territorial integrity or political independence of any other country. And as I said, there are only two exceptions to this, self-defense, and when the Security Council um, uh, approves the attack. A country may use military force in individual or collective self-defense if an armed attack occurs against a UN member country or in response to an imminent attack. It is well established that the need for self-defense must be instant, overwhelming, leaving no choice of means and no moment for deliberation. But Iraq had not attacked any other country for 12 years. It lacked both the capacity and the will to lodge an imminent attack on any country. Its military capability had been severely weakened by the Gulf War, years of punishing sanctions and intrusive inspections, and almost daily bombing raids by the United States and Britain over the no-fly zones. Bush made little pretense that Iraq constituted an imminent threat. Rather, he invoked his own doctrine of preemptive war to justify his attack. The international community was unmoved. Quite simply, the U.S. invasion of Iraq wasn't self-defense because it didn't respond to an armed or imminent attack. The U.N. Charter also declares that no member has the right to enforce any Security Council resolution with military action unless the Council, the Security Council, decides there has been a material breach of its resolutions and all non-military means of enforcement have been exhausted. Then the council, and only the council, may authorize the use of military force. The use of armed force for preemptive or retaliatory purposes is prohibited by the charter. Bush was never interested in achieving a diplomatic solution in Iraq. He, tri he tried mightily to arrange a Security Council resolution that would authorize his war, but the Council refused. Bush then cobbled together prior resolutions to rationalize his invasion. None of them, however, individually or collectively constituted authorization for his use of force against Iraq. Faced with Iraq's increasing cooperation with weapons inspectors in the weeks leading up to the invasion, Bush's rationale for disarming Iraq morphed into regime change to bring democracy to the Iraqi people. But forcible regime change violates the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, a treaty the United States has ratified, which makes it part of U.S. law under the Supremacy Clause of the Constitution. 
Despite the absence of Security Council authorization, a quarter million troops from the United States and the United Kingdom invaded Iraq in March of 2003. Delivering on their promise to shock and awe, the coalition forces dropped several 2,000-pound bombs on Baghdad in rapid succession in what the New York Times dubbed almost biblical power. Since then, the use of cluster bombs, depleted uranium, and white phosphorus gas that burns to the bone by U.S. forces in Iraq has been do 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 documented. These are weapons of mass destruction. The Fourth Geneva Convention re relative to the protection of civilian persons in time of war classifies willfully causing great suffering or serious injury to body or health as a grave breach. And the U.S. War Crimes Act punishes grave breaches of Geneva as war crimes. The Bush administration committed war crimes with its use of those weapons. Operation Iraqi Freedom unleashed a tragedy of immense proportion. Loss of life was not the only shocking and awful consequence of Operation Iraqi Freedom. The United, the United Nations concluded in its July-August 2006 report that bodies found often bear signs of severe torture, including acid-induced injuries and burns caused by chemical substances, missing skin, broken bones on the back, hands, and legs, missing eyes, missing teeth, and wounds caused by power drills or nails. It has recently come to light that Pentagon officials at the highest levels, including General Petraeus, oversaw torture facilities used in the facilities during the war in Iraq. The allegations include rooms used for interrogating detainees stained with blood, children tied into extreme stress positions with their bodies beaten to discoloration, pulling out fingernails, and the list goes on. A veteran of the United States' dirty war in El Salvador, and we've heard about the dirty war with the um, the uh, appointment investiture of the new pope, who may have had some kind of connection with the dirty war in Argentina. But during the 70s and the 80s, the United States supported vicious dictatorships all over Latin America and actually trained their military leaders and their officials at the School of the Americas in how to torture. Uh, the CIA had developed torture manuals, etc. And now it turns out that there's a connection because they brought one of the people who oversaw the dirty war in El Salvador um, to help oversee the torture in, in Iraq. You want me to stop? Oh, no, we're just going back. Okay. All right. <laughs> That's good. Okay. Um, when he was 22 years old, 22 years old, Private First Class Bradley Manning gave classified documents to WikiLeaks, and they included the collateral murder video, which we saw up here, and I don't know if you really got a good look at it, but it's absolutely frightening. Um, it depicts U.S. forces in Apache helicopter killing 12 unarmed civilians, including two journalists and wounding two children. Bradley told the military tribunal during his guilty plea, I believed if the public, particularly the American public, could see this, it could spark a debate on the military and our foreign policy in general as it applied to Iraq and Afghanistan. He hoped that it might cause society to reconsider the need to engage in counterterrorism while ignoring the human situation of the people we engaged with every day. Bradley said he was frustrated, and that was discussed earlier, by his inability to convince his chain of command to investigate the collateral murder video and other war porn documented in the files he provided to WikiLeaks. I was disturbed by the response to injured children. He was bothered by the soldiers depicted in the video who seemed to not value human life by referring to their targets as dead bastards. People trying to rescue the wounded were also fired upon and killed. You saw that with the van when they were trying to get people into the van. A U.S. T a US tank drove over one body, cutting the man in half. 
and the actions of these soldiers shown in that video amount to war crimes under the Geneva Conventions, which prohibit targeting civilians, preventing rescue of the wounded, and defacing dead bodies. If Bradley Manning had committed war crimes instead of exposing them, he would be a free man today. So he pled guilty to several charges which will garner him 20 years in prison. But that wasn't enough for the federal prosecutors. They're going for life in prison, including aiding the enemy in violation of the Espionage Act. Why? To send a message to other would-be whistleblowers that if you do this, this will happen to you as well. When, and they're trying to get Julian Assange who is the owner of WikiLeaks, who is holed up in the Ecuadorian embassy in London, um, who is wanted for questioning regarding a, an alleged sexual assault in Sweden, although no charges have been filed against him, but he is concerned that if he does go to Sweden, that Sweden will extradite him to the United States and he'll be charged with uh, these very serious offenses the way Bradley Manning is. And Bradley Manning made it, made it very clear that no one from WikiLeaks was encouraging him to do what he did. So, Dan Ellsberg was asked about how, and Dan Ellsberg considers Bradley Manning to be a hero, um, asked about parallels between his case and Bradley Manning's. And Dan Ellsberg cited former general counsel of the New York Times, James Goodall, who said, charging Julian Assange with conspiracy to commit espionage would effectively be setting a precedent with a charge that more accurately could be characterized as conspiracy to commit journalism. Dan said that uh, the, the motives of Bradley Manning were the same motives I felt 42 years ago. This is the, uh, the uh, words of, of Dan Ellsberg. We both felt the horror of reading about deceptive and even criminal activity. We both felt the public needed this information and should have had it years ago, so we both released classified documents about a bloody, helpless war. Such criminal, dangerous, and deceptive behavior by the government can only be changed if Congress and the public are informed of them, and when official secrecy allows the government to cover these facts up, the only way to bring them to the public is to break secrecy regulations. Now, an interesting thing that Dan says is that most of the material that Bradley Manning put out was unclassified, and the rest of it was classified secret, which is a relatively low level of classification. All of the Pentagon papers were classified as top secret. And Dan said that Bradley Manning had a clearance that was higher than top secret. So he, Bradley Manning chose not to put out information that was top secret and higher. He purposely chose not to do that. He said that Nixon, Dan said that Nixon could have brought the same charges against him that Obama is bringing against Bradley Manning. Dan says, I was revealing wrongdoing by our government in a public way, and that information could have been read by our enemies in Vietnam. Of course, I never had that intent, and Manning didn't either. We both leaked information to provoke a domestic debate about military force and government secrecy, and to say we did so to aid the enemy is absurd. Now, James Goodall, who was the, um, the when the uh, Nixon administration sued the New York Times, trying to uh, ban it from publishing the documents. And by the way, the New York Times um, did exactly what WikiLeaks did, as did The Guardian and, and Der Spiegel and other, um, other uh, media outlets as well. But you don't see them uh, coming under investigation for these heavy offenses. I wonder why not. Um, James Goodall said, the biggest challenge to the press today is the threatened prosecution of WikiLeaks, and it's absolutely frightening. He said in comparing Pentagon Papers to WikiLeaks, well, I think it's very much the same thing. We have a leak of classified information. And by the way, you've got to remember that Bradley Manning's the leaker. Everyone says Assange is the leaker. He's not. So why are we so concerned about the prosecution of Assange uh, when he did the same thing that the Times did in the Pentagon Papers. 
Um, Obama is, pr is pursuing Julian Assange for publishing information leaked to him by Bradley Manning. If he succeeds in this effort, he will have succeeded where Richard Nixon failed. Now, the My Lai massacre, the only person to be held accountable in any way for the My Lai massacre was Lieutenant William Cowley. He was the fall guy. And originally he got life in prison for he was convicted of murder, murdering 12 civilians. And, and eventually his sentence was reduced and he was eventually exonerated and he only served three and, as they said, three and a half years um, under house arrest um, for what were war crimes. The people who should have been prosecuted for the My Lai Massacre were Richard Nixon and, uh, and his government. Uh, William Calley was, was the, the highest officer prosecuted and he was a lieutenant. Um, now, the Vietnam War also violated the UN Charter. The Security Council never authorized that war and it was not perpetrated in self-defense. You've all heard of the Gulf of Tonkin, which was cooked up to give the United States an excuse to invade North Vietnam. And as a result of the Vietnam War, and I know there are a number of Vietnam veterans here, um, there were three million Indochinese killed, some two to three million. 58,000 Americans died. More American soldiers have committed suicide than were killed in Vietnam. Uh, Post-traumatic stress disorder, which was not even given a name in those days, has claimed many, many victims since then. And the Vietnamese are still suffering, as are American soldiers and Vietnamese Americans, from the effects of Agent Orange, which the United States dropped over much of Vietnam knowing that dioxin, the active ingredient in Agent Orange, is one of the most dangerous chemicals known to man. I was in Vietnam, and I saw children, 30-year-olds, who were sitting there with no arms and legs. There are children who were born without brain cavities. There are still babies being born from mothers and of whose grandmothers had been exposed to Agent Orange, and there are still Vietnam veterans in this country who have cancer and other diseases that are associated with Agent Orange. I actually work with the Vietnam Agent Orange Relief and Responsibility Campaign, and we're trying to get a bill through Congress, which Barbara Lee is about to introduce, um, to compensate for the first time the Vietnamese victims, as well as giving more compensation to the Americans and the Vietnamese Americans for the, one of the most horrific war crimes ever perpetrated, which was the dropping of Agent Orange on Vietnam. And there are still hot spots all over Vietnam where there's still dioxin in the ground, poisoning the atmosphere. Those things need to be cleaned up. And even though Richard Nixon promised reparations, the Vietnamese have not seen one dime of that money. The Nuremberg Charter defines crimes against peace as planning, preparation, initiation, or waging a war of aggression, or a war in violation of international treaties, agreements, or assurances, or participation in a common plan or conspiracy for the accomplishment of any of the foregoing. The Vietnam War and the war in Iraq were wars of aggression, and they therefore constitute crimes against peace. U.S. Supreme Court Justice Robert Jackson was the chief prosecutor at the Nuremberg Tribunal. In his opening statement in 1945, Justice Jackson wrote, no political, military, economic, or other considerations shall serve as an excuse or a justification for a war of aggression. If certain acts and violations of treaties are crimes, they are crimes whether the United States does them or whether Germany does them. And we are not prepared to lay down a rule of criminal conduct against others, which we would be unwilling to have invoked against us. Following the Holocaust, the International Military Tribunal at Nuremberg called the waging of aggressive war essentially an evil thing. To initiate a war of aggression is not only an international crime, it is the supreme international crime, differing only from other war crimes in that it contains within itself 
the accumulated evil of the whole. Justice Jackson labeled the crime of aggression the greatest menace of our times. Those who ordered these war crimes should be tried as war criminals. Thank you.